Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. On today's episode of the show, we're going to be talking about the latest film and TV news and diving once again into the mailbag. My name is Ben Pearson. I'm the senior writer at SlashFilm.com, and I'm joined on today's episode by Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. All right, guys, let's jump into the news first. Uh, Steven Spielberg has a new movie coming out. This announcement came out today, kind of took us by surprise. We had no idea, or I didn't anyway, uh, that that he was considering directing another movie, let alone a film about his own childhood, which is what this new film is supposed to be about. So this is going to be his next directing job um, after West Side Story, which I think he has completed uh, post-production on that movie is going to be coming out later this year. And now a deadline reports today that Spielberg is going to be working on this new untitled film that is sort of loosely inspired by his own childhood growing up in Arizona. And Michelle Williams, who starred in Manchester by the Sea and Venom and many, many other things, is in negotiations to play a character who is inspired by Spielberg's mother. Um, We don't really know too many other details about like the actual plot or what it's supposed to be about. We know that um, he is going to be uh, casting uh, children at multiple age levels. One of them is going to be playing the part that is inspired by the young Spielberg. Um, production is supposed to begin this summer, and this movie is expected to come out sometime next year, 2022. Uh, and we also, I guess one of the biggest other notable things here is that Spielberg is actually going to be writing this script alongside uh Tony Kushner, who is an Oscar nominated writer who has become one of Spielberg's sort of go to guys over the past 10 years. They've previously worked together on uh, Munich and Lincoln and West Side Story and this movie that Spielberg has not made yet called The Kidnapping of Edgaro Mortara. Um, And Spielberg uh, has really only um, written three of the movies, the the feature films that he has directed before. So he wrote uh, the story for the Sugarland Express in 1974. He wrote the screenplay for uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind in 1977. And then he also wrote the script for AI artificial intelligence in 2001. But that was 20 years ago. And this is the you know, that's, that was the last time that Spielberg wrote anything that he, uh, you know, has directed in terms of feature films. So this is, um, I think going to be, you know, a more personal project for him. It sounds like, um, the idea that he's, you know, not only getting behind the camera, but also writing the script or co-writing the script, um, seems like it's going to be him just like, you know, pouring (laughs) a lot of his personal experiences into this movie. So, uh, like I said, this was kind of a surprise to all of us. Uh, Chris, you know, you, hosted and and produced an entire podcast about the uh, 21st century Spielberg works. What do you think about this new project? Uh, This is great. I'm I'm excited about this. Uh, He's actually talked about making a movie about his childhood before in the past. And Oh, interesting. At the time it was called, I think it was called growing up or something like that. And at the same time he said, uh, this was like back in like, the late eighties, early nineties. And he was wow. And he was like, you know, I haven't, I haven't actually grown up enough yet to make this movie, but so I, I do wonder, like, you know, he's an older guy now and it's, it's interesting that, you know, he's, he's, he's at this age where he's, you know, I don't want to say he's at the end of his career cause I'm sure he'll, he'll keep directing until he drops dead, but it's, it's, it's uh, a little wistful, I guess, a little melancholy to think that like, ah, Steven Spielberg has, <laughs> has finally felt like he's grown up enough to make this movie that he, he you know, never felt, he was old enough to make yet. And um, uh, I, I can't wait to just see how it turns out, especially the fact that he's working with Tony Kushner again, because Tony Kushner is a great writer and the scripts he's written for Spielberg have just been uh, dynamite. Like uh, I've said this in the past, but I, I honestly think Munich is probably Steven Spielberg's best movie. And um, uh, he wrote that and he wrote Lincoln, which is great. And so I, I just, I love everything about this. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> um, so, Brad, to me, there there might not be any other mainstream American director that is as closely tied with like the idea and imagery of childhood as Steven Spielberg. So, since he has, um, you know, really built his career and so especially like the the early to middle part of his career, um, you know, creating these like defining iconic. Uh, images of childhood and and all of that kind of stuff. You you would think that maybe he mined some of his own experiences for those projects. What do you think about the idea of him like explicitly making a movie that is inspired by his own childhood now? 
You know, I think with Spielberg, a lot of what he's he's done as far as emulating his own childhood c- came more so thematically than real life um, inspired. You know, he's he's injected a lot of um, things, especially about his his father and his relationship with his father in, into his films. And so I think that doing something that's a little bit more directly tied to his childhood will probably elicit something that is um, maybe even more personal than anything he's done before. Um Say for maybe you know Schindler's List, which is personal for you know a different kind of reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but I th- so I think that this yeah this is well, something that be a lot more different than you know most of the movies he does. He he injects this you know family relationship and dynamic and struggles into larger stories. You know to give them a sense of humanity and an emotional core. And I think if this is more so just focused on that idea of family itself, it could be something that's a lot more intimate. Cool. All right. So uh, our next story involves WandaVision and there are going to be spoilers here for the finale of WandaVision. I'm assuming that if you're listening to this episode by now, you've probably seen uh, the the series finale of WandaVision. We did a whole episode on Friday talking about that in great detail. Um, so now this is your final opportunity to skip forward or pause the, the episode until you have a chance to do that. But uh, Brad, what is the latest in terms of uh, Catherine Hahn's character, her future in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Yeah, I mean, everyone is uh, going crazy for Catherine Hahn thanks to WandaVision. Uh, I think people should have been going crazy for Catherine Hahn long before this because she's been a treasure for uh, most of her career. Um, but it's it's nice to see people coming around and seeing how incredible she is with her playing um, Agnes and then now Agatha Harkness uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the, the end of WandaVision kind of, um, it, it gives her a, a conclusion, so to speak, but it also leaves it open-ended for her potential return in the MCU. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Catherine Hahn feels in the same way that fans do that maybe there's the possibility uh, that Agatha may be needed by Wanda uh, sometime in the future now that she's tapping into her true power as the Scarlet Witch. Um, during an interview with the New York Times, uh, Catherine Hahn said, uh, I felt that very strongly too. At the end of that, uh, there was a possibility that we'd join up, that she'd collapse into my arms and we'd fly off together, which I kind of wish would have happened, or she would just hand it off to me. And obviously she's joking a little bit uh, there about how that would have gone down, but there there does seem to be the possibility that um, by the time Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness comes around, which Elizabeth Olsen is supposed to be in as Wanda Maximoff, uh, a.k.a. the Scarlet Witch now, that maybe she'll need to call upon uh, Agatha. And she even, you know, references that as, as such in WandaVision. Agatha says, you're, you know, you're going to need me. You have no idea, you know, what, what, you're, what you've done or what you're doing. And she says, well, if I do, then I know where to find you. And since we saw her... Um, tapped back into or at least forced into the personality of the nosy neighbor Agnes uh, stuck in Westview um, with the the people who are now living there free of uh, Wanda's control. Uh, she knows that if she ever has any questions, maybe somehow needs her and her uh, long experience as, as a witch that she can find her and bring her into the fray. So we haven't heard anything about her being part of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, but that's certainly something they would keep under tight wraps for the time being, especially to avoid any potential spoilers for WandaVision. Uh, And Catherine Hahn's definitely excited about it. She says, uh, now that I have a taste of it, I'm like, uh, ah, I really, really love it. So hopefully she will be be coming back at at some point as Agatha Harkness, but she she hasn't heard anything. And even if she did, she would probably still be very, very tight-lipped about it. Right. So I think Doctor Strange 2 is film either filming right now or, you know, in the early stages of that, like very close to filming in London, Brad. Am I right about that? They are, that, yeah, they are. Correct? They are currently filming. I know they took a break for a little bit, um, I think earlier this year or over Christmas because they U- UK did another lockdown. But I think that they are mm. back at it because Bruce Campbell recently posted something that seemed to allude to uh, having some kind of cameo role in Doctor Strange. So. Yes. Okay. So um, I know that you and Peter talked about this on Friday's episode a little bit, like the idea that maybe Agatha Harkness shows back up in Doctor Strange 2. I'm curious, though, what do you think about I don't I wish I had the the exact quote in front of me and I do not. So I apologize for this. But uh, paraphrasing, Kevin Feige said before WandaVision came out, he said, um, I think in the early round of like when all of these Disney plus Marvel shows were announced, that basically these shows were going to be um, like not necessarily required viewing. And I, again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there. Like he wants the film, uh, the films to essentially be able to 
work as like their own interconnected narrative. And he doesn't want to necessarily like require everybody who wants to stay up on the Marvel Cinematic Universe to have to watch every single show and all of the movies. Like, I think he, he's smart enough to know that that might be, you know, of course the, the fans are going to do that. But um, if, you know, uh, a movie just suddenly starts referencing the events that happened in a TV show, I think he knows that that'll throw a lot of people off. Um, so what do you think about that idea, Brad? The idea of like, you know, let's say in Doctor Strange 2, uh, all of a sudden, uh, Catherine Hahn shows up as Agatha Harkness. Like, people who didn't watch WandaVision will have no idea what the the backstory is there. Do you think that there's a way to, um, you know, sort of suavely uh, work that in where it's it doesn't necessarily require a ton of uh, previous knowledge? What, what do you make of that? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, some of that, I think, maybe is Kevin Feige balancing expectations and, you know, making sure that he keeps the audience for Marvel movies um as open as possible so that they don't feel like they have to do all this homework in order to continue enjoying the movies in the franchise even though at this point keeping up with the marvel movies themselves has become something that you know can be rather daunting you know with uh what is it 25 movies now i think yeah, we're at, like yeah. and so in this specific case i feel like it probably wouldn't be too difficult to bring in someone like agatha harkness into doctor strange in the multiverse of madness and you wouldn't need necessarily need to know her the entire backstory of wandavision because i feel like it's something that maybe strange himself might need explaining about, uh, you know, he's the sorcerer Supreme. I'm sure he knows plenty of things, but I wouldn't be surprised if like, if Agatha Harkness is brought into Dr. Strange, if they, if there's just a brief dialogue exchange where Elizabeth Olsen says, says this is, you know, this is Agatha Harkness, you know, and uh, you know, I had, you know, such and such experience with her just to give him a basic crash course before yeah. needing her help or something like that, you know? Yeah, I'm just imagining a scenario where, like, you know, in the middle of the movie, there's a pause where Elizabeth Olsen, like, flies back to Westview and this, you know, for the movie audiences, seemingly random woman is, like, acting like a sitcom character. And then she, like, you know, <laughs> Elizabeth Olsen, like, snaps her out of it. And then all of a sudden, like, it just seems like a, um, you know, a totally out of nowhere kind of thing. But yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe if she, like, walks strange through it with her and uh is able to and it, sort of like it could even be a, a, like a simple comedic thing to do with it too where he brings her back and she's acting like that character and she snaps him out of it and strange just looks at her quizzically and she's like don't worry about it it's a long story mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah i guess that's true um okay so yeah and, and i like what do you think about the idea if she doesn't show up specifically in that movie we don't know as of yet any other movies that uh that Elizabeth Olsen's Scarlet Witch is attached to appear in, right? Like, do, do we know that she's going to show up in Spider-Man? What is it called? No Way Home? No, we haven't, um, we haven't heard anything about that. She was asked about it at one point, and she said, if she says, if I'm in it, I haven't heard about it yet, which is also, okay. also entirely possible. Um, and again, we've seen countless times uh, Marvel actors tap dance and flat out lie to keep secret sure. secrets. So, you know, it's anybody's guess and who knows who's telling the truth. Yeah. That one's, that one's another multiverse property, which are, or project that's going to incorporate aspects of the multiverse, which is why I, I mentioned it, but yeah, maybe, I mean, who knows, maybe they'll, they'll save Catherine Hahn for like another season of a, a TV show or something like that. Um, and she won't pop up in any of these movies, but uh, it's, it's good to hear that we hopefully will be getting more of her, you know, at, at some point, it's just weird you know in terms of like pinpointing exactly when that's going to be uh, i think it's still too early to know but um okay let's go to our third and final news story for today and that also involves marvel in some sort of roundabout way uh chris tell us tell us what the latest is uh on the avatar front uh yeah so avatar is being re-released in china this weekend uh, and this news comes as kind of a surprise to everyone no one was expecting it but it's it's happening and it comes with an interesting side note uh, in that if this re-release takes in just $7.4 million, it will end up uh, knocking Avengers Endgame out of the top spot for biggest box office earner of all time. Uh, Avatar is currently at number two. It used to be number one, then Endgame came out and took over. Uh, you know, In the long run, <laughs> that's not going to matter because technically both movies are owned by Disney uh, right now, but it's in... It will be very, very funny to me, at least, if <laughs> if this happens. Um, I'm not 100% sure why this is happening. Uh, after our version went up, uh, Scott Mendelson, who 
covers box office at Forbes and, and therefore knows a hell of a lot more about this stuff than, than I do, uh, wrote an article. And he's saying um, that the reason it's happening is to sort of test the waters to see if, you know, the Chinese market even needs Hollywood tent poles anymore. You know, there was a time where Hollywood uh, relied a lot on, on Chinese box office, but his article is saying that China has their own big tent poles now and they don't really, they might not need Hollywood anymore. So this could be them sort of testing the waters being like, does anyone even care about movies from Hollywood anymore when we have our own movies? So huh, that is really interesting. Yeah. I would have just assumed that it was, you know, sort of like partially testing the waters for the upcoming avatar sequels right. to see like, it could if, be that too. Yeah. If anyone <laughs> even gives a shit about avatar anymore. Right. Um, huh. Yeah. I had not considered that, but that that's like a whole new wrinkle in this thing. That seems like a um, weird way to test that though, because like, can you really judge that based on re-releasing a movie that's, so old now you know like there has to be much more interest in new blockbusters from hollywood than there ever would be in a one that's you know going on what 12 years old now or something yeah yeah right Uh, i mean like i don't i don't know if like the the forbes article is 100 percent correct on that but i'm just basing it off of what he's saying and like i said he covers box office so uh, he definitely knows more than me on this subject but (laughs) I I i don't know what the real reason is so, Chris, do you think like uh, you mentioned that, you know, both of these movies are technically under the Disney umbrella now. So it really it doesn't matter that much. But, you know, Hollywood is full of uh, of huge egos. And do you think this is like a, an ego thing like that? That might be what what's um, driving this that maybe like, like James Cameron is pushing this or like the executives who, you know, who uh, like greenlit Avatar in the first place are like, you know, trying to desperately do whatever they can to, to reclaim this crown from the, the dreaded russo brothers like Look, i i have no proof that that's happening uh, but a part of me really wants to believe that james cameron is that petty and that like <laughs> he was sitting in his submarine one day and he was like god damn it i want that top box office spot again yeah and he's just like picked up his whatever satellite phone whatever his he, sub phone yeah whatever he has at the bottom <laughs> of the sea and he can he <laughs> called someone it was like we're making this happen god damn it i want i want to believe that's happening here uh i actually would respect james cameron yeah. a hell of a lot more if that if that was the case so hopefully somebody can uh maybe, maybe i'll try to get his sub phone number and give him a call yeah, dial him up him. At the, at, on the coral reef he's at right now, <laughs> all right so let's get into the mailbag we have uh, one question here and i think this is the last question that we have in the mailbag as of right now so this is a, another open call for if anybody has any other questions please email them to peter at slash com, and maybe we'll talk about them on a future episode. But uh, in today's mailbag a segment, Tyler from Seattle writes, and he says, I just watched Hearts of Darkness and was thinking, what are the best movies about other movies? Most that I think of are documentaries, but there are more narrative films like Ed Wood or The Disaster Artist. Some of my favorites are Best Worst Movie and Overnight. What are some of yours? Um, best Worst Movie is about the making of Troll 2, and Overnight, I believe, is the one that is about the making of uh, the Boondock Saints. And uh, both of those are, are very, very entertaining uh, documentaries. Obviously, you guys, if you're listening to this, you probably know what Ed Wood is and what the disaster artist is. Um, I have a couple entries here. Um, Hail Caesar uh, from the Coen Brothers came out in 2016. Is I feel like a movie that not a lot of people talk about anymore but i think it's really like one of their sort of underrated classics um i am probably in the minority there but it has a terrific cast and uh is very like um you know it, it has this wonderful setup of uh uh, Josh Brolin playing this fixer character who wanders around a studio a lot and and sort of enters and exits a bunch of different types of movies and and witnesses and and interacts with a bunch of different types of filmmaking that all took place sort of over the the golden era of Hollywood in the 1950s. Um, so I, I think that movie is definitely worth seeking out, and I, I'm guessing a lot of people skipped it or you know maybe heard iffy things about it at the time. But I I'm like one of the people who would go to bat for Hail Caesar. So I think it's definitely uh, one of my favorites in this category. Um, One Cut of the Dead is a Japanese zombie comedy that we talked about a lot. Um, I think the, I don't even remember what year it was when it came to the United States. I know it was released in Japan in 2017 and did like gangbusters box office numbers there. Um, But it's this really, really great movie about filmmaking and, and the, the sort of collaborative process of, 
uh, that that scrappy nature of like not having a ton of money and and getting a, a team together, a group together, and all you know doing putting your your blood, sweat, and tears into um, achieving the the same goal, and it's uh, this really funny and uh, kind of argue like moving at certain moments. Um, uh, zombie comedy that uh, is is it, it surprised the hell out of me when I saw it. So I would definitely recommend that one as well. And then um, sort of in line with uh, Tyler from Seattle's. Hearts of Darkness, which is the documentary about the making of um, Apocalypse Now, there's a documentary called Burden of Dreams that came out in 1982 that is about uh, the making of uh, Werner Herzog's uh, Fitzcarraldo, the 1982 film that basically, for those of you who don't know, is about the one where he tries to um, move a ship through the jungle over this giant mountain, basically. Um, And the documentary Burden of Dreams... uh, yeah, like documents chronicles um, the sort of insanity of of the making of that film and is incredibly entertaining as well. So um, those are three for me. Uh, Brad, let's go to you. What are what are some of your favorites or or memorable entries in this sort of subgenre? Uh, so since Hearts of Darkness is mentioned, I definitely couldn't go uh, without mentioning Tropic Thunder. Uh, Tropic Thunder isn't necessarily about the making of a real movie, but it does lampoon the making of a movie and specifically. Uh, the making of a movie like Apocalypse Now, which Hearts of Darkness uh, is about. And so definitely have to mention that one. Uh, Incredible ensemble cast, uh, you know, amazing comedic performances. Uh, It still makes me crack up to this day, especially, seriously, I never get tired of Tom Cruise as Les Grossman. Such an incredible, hilarious performance by him. And I just, I I always laugh anytime uh, I see any bit of his performance from that movie. So, um Also, I'm going to mention Brigsby Bear. This is a much more low-key indie movie. Played Sundance a while back. Um, It stars Kyle Mooney. And it is really just about the creativity and just the uh, desire to make something that, you know, connects you and your friends. Gives you something to to strive for. Allows you to um, just really tap into your identity and, you know, tell a story that is very much yours even if it's a little bit weird and it's uh it has some of the hallmarks of the kind of um quirkier work that Kyle Mooney usually does with uh someone like Beck Bennett on Saturday Night Live when they do their weirder pre-recorded uh sketches but it um has a lot of heart has uh, this also has a really good ensemble cast as well and it's um if you can seek it out it's um available on stars which I know a lot of people probably don't go out of their way to subscribe to you, but if you can uh, rent it any other way, it's absolutely worth um, a rental, and I think that you'll you'll really end up liking it. Um, and then uh, I also love Bowfinger, which is uh, an Eddie Murphy movie from 1999 with Steve Martin, and uh, it's definitely uh, on the goofier side. It's not, uh, even though Eddie Murphy Eddie Murphy plays multiple characters, uh, two specifically, one that's kind of like a version of himself, and another that's um, a very geeky, nerdy um, doppelganger for that character. Is um, it's silly, but it's does a nice job of sending up Hollywood, and um, especially with Steve Martin playing a very Steve Martin character as this producer trying to get a movie made called Chubby Rain. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is also in it. Heather Graham is in it. And uh, it's definitely one of the better comedies that he made in, as he started to kind of fall off from the late 90s into the early 2000s when he was doing far too much of the multiple character shtick and not doing nearly as good a comedy as he used to. I've still never seen Bowfinger, Brad. Does this one hold up pretty well? I think so. I I will say that it's it's definitely more on the like the the immature, you know, silly side kind of things. It's um a very exaggerated sort of, sort of movie and it, but it has the spirit of like a, uh, actually this is another movie that um, I guess you could kind of say is almost about making movies, but three amigos. Um, it kind of has that, that kind of spirit to it. Um, mm-hmm. It feels, it feels like a movie that could have easily been made in the, in the eighties, uh, but it was made in, in 1999. So I, I think it's, I'd be interested to see what you think about it after watching it. Yeah, I'll try to check that one out. And speaking of Heather Graham, uh, this isn't necessarily the kind of movies we're talking about, but Boogie Nights is 100% about making a very specific kind of movie. Um, <laughs> and uh, funnily enough, she kind of kind of plays a similar uh, character in Boogie Nights. But again, since this is a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, uh, the ensemble cast in, in this film is one of the best assembled. And uh, I, as stressful and, um, you know, bleak as this movie is I never get tired of watching it. You know, it's it's um, a long one because it's a PTA movie, but 
the performances in this movie from Philip Seymour Hoffman to uh, Burt Reynolds, Julianne Moore, William H. Macy, just uh, everyone in this movie gives an outstanding performance and you, you can't go wrong uh, with a movie that, you know, takes such a, a hard hitting look at the porn industry. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right, Chris, what about you? Uh, I guess it, like, it depends on if this question is asking like movies about making real movies, like movies that exist. Uh, and if it is, I would say again, Ed Wood, which the question already mentioned, but I don't care. Um, that's <laughs> just like one of my, my, I, I honestly think that's the last great Tim Burton movie. I think Tim Burton has made good movies since then. Like big fish is a good movie, but Ed Wood, I think is Tim Burton's last great movie. And it's just this really sweet movie about, you know, misfits and losers who, you know, really don't know what they're doing, but they're going to do it anyway. <laughs> God damn it. And I just, I love the spirit of that movie. Um, another would be The Aviator, which isn't entirely about making a movie, but um, it's Martin Scorsese's movie about Howard Hughes. And like the first half of that movie is all about Howard Hughes trying to make Hell's Angels and break into Hollywood, even though he has like no experience. He just comes to town and he's a really rich guy and he's going to make that movie. God damn it. <laughs> um, uh, and then on the other side of the coin, you know, movies that aren't really about making real movies, but they're about the movie business. Um, uh, I think great examples are uh, The Player, which is Robert Altman's movie, which is about um, a movie producer. Tim Robbins plays a movie producer who's getting death threats in the mail and he thinks he knows where they're coming from. And it just leads to this whole, uh, I want to call it like a comedy of errors, but it's like a dark comedy of errors. It's just <laughs> a series of unfortunate events befall him. Uh, another good example would be uh, Mulholland Drive, David Lynch's movie about uh, an aspiring actress who comes to Hollywood and everything goes very, very wrong and it's dark and it's twisted and it's just phenomenal. Man, it's been a long time since I've seen that. Are, are there any uh, scenes in that movie, do you remember, that actually have her filming? Or is it all just about like There's the a, a, adjacent stuff? There is a great scene where uh, Naomi Watts is the actress who does uh, a screen test to be in the movie. And the, the acting in that scene that she does in particular is just fucking phenomenal. And it mm. like, like, that was like the first time I think any, it wasn't like Naomi Watts' first movie, but that's the movie that sort of made her a, a bigger star because she's just so good in that movie, specifically that scene. Yeah. I'm due for a rewatch on that one for sure. It's great. Uh, another more recent example, once upon a time in Hollywood, which is just a, a wonderful movie. I know not everyone loved that movie and that's fine, but I, I, I don't know if it's my favorite Tarantino movie, but it's it's definitely up there because yes, it's it has all his, you know, stuff in it and it's it's it gets uh outrageously violent, especially in the last like twenty or so minutes, but it's another movie that's that's genuinely kind of sweet and it, it's it's about movies as magic and there's like that whole sequence where Margot Robbie as Sharon Tate goes to the movies and watches herself and Tarantino does this great thing where instead of just having uh, Margot Robbie recreate scenes of Sharon Tate, he literally has Margot Robbie watching the real Sharon Tate. And there's just something just so uh, genuinely, uh, I, I've said, uh, I said touching already, but I'll say it again about that, that scene to me. Chris, Sorry. real quick, I have to put you on the spot. What is your favorite uh, movie within Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Do you have one? Oh man, I don't know. I get, I get. I, the fourteen fists of McCluskey is just. Like, I would probably have great, to go with that. Just it's the, such a great title, and like hearing Pacino in my mind deliver those lines, and just like talking about that movie so lovingly. That that film within the film is so. Uh, it's it's just great stuff. Yeah, it's so good. And then um, finally, it would be uh, Barton Fink, which is one of my favorite Coen Brothers movies. Uh, John Turturro plays. Uh, he's a playwright in New York, and in. Um, I think it's like the 1930s. I forget what the exact era is. And he gets called out to Hollywood to write a screenplay. He's, he gets called to Hollywood to write a wrestling movie. And he immediately has writer's block. And the whole movie is about him trying to write this goddamn wrestling movie. And he can't do it. And he's staying at this hotel, which is sort of like a metaphor for hell. And his, his next door neighbor is, is John Goodman. And it's, it's, it's so goddamn good. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't want to be like, hey, have you heard of these Coen Brothers guys? They're good. Everyone, everyone, everyone knows the Coen Brothers are good at what they do. But Barton Fink is definitely like near the top of my my favorite Coen Brothers movie list. The idea of uh, somebody sort of getting called out to Hollywood, like a previous 
uh, you know, somebody who's working in a, in a, as a writer getting called out to Hollywood reminded me of Mank, which is another one that we could have put on this list. Um, and I mean, there are probably, you know, 400 other movies that, that sort of fit within this subgenre. So uh, if you want to, you can shoot us an email and let, let us know what your favorite is or just like yell at us for leaving your favorite off the list. I'll just say the words singing in the rain right now so I can cut off the... Oh, I the, feel like an idiot for not mentioning that myself. So thank you. <laughs> the flow of emails that might have uh, might have started because we, we didn't mention that one. But um, yeah, there are tons of great examples here. So thank you uh, to Tyler from Seattle for that uh, prompt. I... I Need to add um, Mulholland Drive and uh, both anchor back to my queue and uh, and rewatch some of these. So hopefully, uh, it inspired some other listeners out there to uh, to add some of these films to their their watch lists as well. Um, oh, you and find, of course, oh, I can't yes. believe we didn't mention the great scene in the Mortal Kombat movie where Johnny Cage is making. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing someone at home listening to this, and being like they didn't mention the scene where Johnny Cage gets called out to. Oh my God. Wow. Uh, I have a story about the first time, first and only time that I watched Mortal Kombat. Um, I'll save that until the new Mortal Kombat movie comes out, but I'll remind me to tell you guys that on the, on the podcast, it involves a, uh, an elementary school teacher and things going wrong. So it involves the time um, you were summoned to an Island to take part <laughs> in a fighting tournament to save the world. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Uh, so you can find more about all the stories that we mentioned on today's show at slash film.com. I'm sure there's some mortal combat stuff there. You can find too, if you're interested in that. Uh, and slash film daily is published every weekday, bringing the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find on the site. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps, and send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns, and additional uh, mailbag topics to peter at slashfilm.com. Make sure to leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention your email on the air. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends, spread the word. Thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you all tomorrow.